you know, founded in morality based on what you would think is, you know, our moral principles of, of aggressive use of force. You know, you cannot, uh, you know, you, you have to escalate through, what, it, what it, was it, you know, you might have heard this, you know, shout, show, um, shove, shoot, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, there's an escalation there. You don't go straight to, to deadly force if you don't have to. And you have to have positive uh, identification of any targets before, uh, before firing. Of course, then it turned into, well, any suspicious observer. So we could shoot anybody, or w- rather we were supposed to shoot anybody, you know, who, had, who was on top of a building with a cell phone or binoculars. And they became fair game. And then we imposed a curfew on the city. And it was anybody out after dark you could shoot. So, I mean, there was a, there was a total divorce from morality there that, that was very disturbing. I was, I was fortunate enough that, uh, you know, I, I never had to pull the trigger as I was always, you know, behind somebody or driving when we were getting shot at it. I never had positive identification. Mm-hmm. But for the guys in the vehicle I was driving on, machine guns or, you know, in other vehicles in the convoy, you know, you're getting fire from, from a building, and you know that if you violate your rules of engagement and you engage that, in that general direction where you saw that muzzle flash, you're more likely to come home alive. And the Marines in your convoy are more likely to come home alive. They're pitting your survival instincts against your morals and putting you in an impossible situation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, human nature is such that in the heat of battle, survival instincts usually went out. And so to think that the people that are engineering these occupations don't know that civilians are going to die inevitably in the, in, in the situations they're creating is absurd. So that was very, very formative for me to be exposed to all that. But I came home and I was dealing with the post-traumatic stress disorder, and it wasn't until a couple years later that I was able to get the emotional perspective on my experience to realize how criminal the, the enterprise that I was a part of was. Well, how long did you actually spend in Iraq? Seven months. Typical tour for Marines now. Uh, it was enough. February, September of 2004 in, in the Fallujah area. And then you said, you know, you came back. It took you a couple of years to really uh, deal with this emotionally. When do you start getting involved in activism, telling your story to others? Because I always tell people, you know, if they really don't know what's going on in Iraq, go check out the movie Iraq for Sale. It gives a pretty good mm. representation of what's really going down uh, there and, you know, this for-profit war. I- I've actually seen some of the people that have uh, been featured in that live and, you know, taped their interviews and whatnot. So, I-, I mean, it was a very eye-opening film for me. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's actually... Yeah, I-, I, have. I have. I have some friends, actually, veterans who are in that movie who are members of Iraq Veterans Against the War. Mm-hmm. But it largely focuses, as the title implies, on the kind of uh, economic corruption. I mean, yes. all corruption is inherently economic. But the, the, the direct criminality with, with the way the money is flowing in Iraq. Sure. Uh, as opposed to the way the bullets are, are flowing in Iraq, which is a whole other level of criminality. And mm-hmm. if you want to find out more about that, you know, we do have a documentary coming out called uh, Winter Soldier uh, that's in production right now for uh, Iraq Veterans Against the War. But if you want to hear some of the real stories, we have a whole collection of testimony at IVAW.org on our website. But, but let me say just, in the abstract and stepping back, it's one thing for, for me as a veteran to come home and tell my story and say, you know what, this war is screwed up. This war is not what they tell you it is. Here's the, here's the real dope. You know, this is what we saw. This is what's going on. And this is why we need to come together and stop it. But, and, and you can unite a lot of people around that. And as we've seen, we've really got most of the country on our side that, you know, we need to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan one way or another despite the national dialogue and, and all of the propaganda around it. But that doesn't get to the broader problem of statism and the fact that, you know, we still want to turn to government to solve problems in society that we should be able to solve for ourselves without the aggressive use of force that really everything government does is contingent upon. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 like I said, as obvious as it is, you know, like for me to say, well, I, I went to Iraq, people are telling, you know, distortions and lies about what's going on in Iraq, and i got to set the record straight. You know what? There's a lot more stories that need to be told about people suffering at the hands of statism. I want, to, I want people to be able to come out and tell the stories that, hey, I just got a $200 parking ticket, and that's two, two uh, loads of groceries that my family's not going to get this month. Mm-hmm. You know, all of those stupid, embarrassing, painful stories. You know, I, people that, that suffer because of the IRS, for those stories to be told, the ones that are that are really every day that can get people 
thinking about the true nature of statism. So I hope that, you know, what, what, what I've done as, as a veteran coming home and telling my story and helping other veterans tell their stories doesn't just inspire more veterans, but everybody to talk and, and tell those stories that they might not otherwise. Yeah, on the other side, I want to get your take on these uh, DHS and MIAC reports that are really demonizing Iraqi war veterans who are coming home. The oh, fact yeah. that they're now tra training the Boy Scouts and the Explorers program to go after extremists and terrorists. And the example is a disgruntled Iraq war veteran. Back after this, it's the Info Warrior. The New World Order beast is genetically modifying your food, mixing vegetables with animals, and now experimenting with viruses. Without a long-term long food solution, you will have just two options. Starve, surrender, or surrender. surrender. All canned food supplies. All canned food supplies will eventually run out. What then? Then. Grow your own healthy food and feed your family forever. SurvivalistSeeds.com is now the nation's largest bulk heirloom seed company. And it's owned by a real patriot, Big John Lipscomb. You can now, you can have, now have an infinite amount of healthy vegetables like a watermelon, a bundle of carrots, or tomatoes for a little more than a penny each. SurvivalistSeeds.com. And now you can go into business with Big John at SurvivalistSeeds.com by becoming an affiliate. See his link at SurvivalistSeeds.com. guest this evening is Adam Kokish. He's running for Congress in uh, New Mexico. The uh, website is kokishforcongress.com. That's K-O-K-E-S-H for congress.com. Now, well, <coughs> hey, the, just, just yes. in case the FEC is listening in, I got to be really clear uh, uh -huh. that, that we're technically in the exploratory phase right now. We haven't filed, uh, okay. so we're not running yet, but what we're doing really is just putting all the pieces together. And if, if the support keeps coming in as it has this thus far, you know, we got a great letter of support from Ron Paul. Uh, we've gotten tons of great letters of support coming in. Uh, I'm in D.C. right now. We've gotten a lot of help from people on uh, various actors who shall remain nameless on, on Capitol Hill that are excited about this. Um, but just in case the, uh, you know, the FBI agents who are listening to your show are talking <laughs> to the people at the FEC, we've got to make that clear. All right, I got you, man. Hey, hey, of course, but I am encouraging to, you to run. I'm looking at the website right now. It really looks like you are ready to run, and I think that's great news. So so in this uh, short segment, I want to get your take on this MIAC report, which demonizes just about anyone they want in the United States, you know, from people in the alternative media, such as myself, people who are anti-illegal immigration, people who are anti-abortion, uh, quote-unquote lone wolf extremists, uh, mm -hmm. Iraq war veterans, uh, veterans of other wars, people who like the, the, uh, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, consider themselves members of the quote-unquote patriot movement, have Ron Paul bumper stickers. I mean, I could probably go on for the whole segment with everything they put in there. I mean, if you watch Zeitgeist or you have America to Freedom mm -hmm. to Fascism in your car, it's just unbelievable to me that they put this on paper and people were not only not outraged enough, I mean, it made the mainstream media, but after we have some nut shoot somebody in a Holocaust museum last week, and that's not, it's not like that's the first time that's happened. We've had nuts shoot people throughout history, and especially in this country. Uh, all of a sudden, they're saying that these reports were justified. Well, they call us domestic terrorists, right? Yeah. Well, we're domestic, but a lot of us are armed as we assert our rights under the Second Amendment, the basic human right to self-defense. And you know what? I want them to be scared. They better be scared. And if a terrorist is someone who uses fear to affect the policies of government, yeah, I'm a mother friggin' domestic terrorist. You better believe it. Well, those are some pretty strong words, but I, I think it's just unfair the way that they've treated, uh, you know, us like children, putting it on paper that basically everybody is an extremist, everybody is a terrorist, and now they want to bring in Sonia Sotomayor as uh, the next Supreme Court justice. She's written a book called America's Deadly Obsession, where she clearly states that the Second uh, Amendment to the Constitution actually says that, no, we don't have... A, uh, a right to uh, keep and bear arms, that's for the military. I mean, this is a gun grabber on another level. Mm. Oh, yeah. 
Well, you, you don't have to tell me about Sotomayor, but the uh, you know the only kind of serious quote unquote serious candidates we'd have for the Supreme Court would be products of our completely corrupt judicial system. But if, I, I, I always like to take it back to the real root of the problem, and it's not the judicial system. It's the fact that we as Americans have lost sight of the one thing that is sacred about this country, and it's not our judicial system. It's not our borders. It's not our economy. It's not our military. It's not even our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, our Declaration. Documents written by mortals know the only thing sacred about America is the fact that at our founding, the brave men and women pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors to the principles of liberty.